Okay, so this is interim test number three. We're continuing a number six problem. We got cut off. Uh, second random sampling of 25 books in which 42% of the books have less than 100 pages and 58% of the books have more than 100 pages supports the results. Well, the more than 100 pages, more than 100 pages should have been the 40, and they're saying that that's the 58. So these numbers are kind of switched. That might be pretty close to supporting, but the numbers were switched. They had the switched less than and more than amount, so forget that one. Uh, letter C. It may be estimated that the percentage of young adult fiction books with less than 100 pages is 15%. Oh, I think they got confused on that one. 15%, it's 15 out of 25, but we know that 15 out of 25 is equal to multiply by 4, multiply by 4, 60%. So that one's no. It may be estimated that the percentage of young adult fiction books with more than 100 pages is 40%. Well, greater than 100 pages, more, I put an up arrow just so I would remember, is 40%. That's exactly what we calculated. So choice D is what we like. Question 7. The principal at a middle school was concerned about the number of students, student absences during the fall semester. She selected a group of 20 students to record the number of absences the students have in the fall and the spring semesters. The histogram, so that's just a way that you have pictures, bar graphs showing exactly what's going on, below shows the number of absences for each of the 20 students in each semester. So I just went ahead and put how tall the bars are, just so that I would see it on top. So this was three, this is one, 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 two, two, nothing for six, three, four, three. Did the same thing here, two, three, two, nothing for three, one, three, two, 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 and three. We knew that it was 20 students. We know that from up above. If ever you're not sure, just look up above, 20 students. Well, if we were trying to find the median, you could list out all these numbers. I'd have to list the number zero three times, because there's three of them, the number one once, two once, three once, four twice, and just keep going like that, five twice. Seven has to be three times, seven, 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 four eights, and three nines. Now, if there's 20 students, that means you have to find the two middle ones. So I can take 20, uh, subtract two, that's 18, divide by two, that's going to be nine. I can cancel out nine on this side and nine on that side, and that leaves me with five and seven. So to find the average of five and seven, I could add five plus seven, which is 12, and divide by two to get six. Or I could just think, what goes right in between five and seven? And that would still be six. So here for the fall semester, the, me um, yeah, the median is six. For the spring semester, same thing. I'm going to list them all out, however many times that number appears, and I cross out nine on each side, and the two middle numbers here are both fives, so no matter how you slice it, the median is five. Next. There's some data on the other page, so I'm going to have to flip back and forth so you can see. So the first question part asks, in each semester, at least 35% of the selected students missed eight days or more. Okay, well, it was out of 20 students, so 35%. Well, for eight days or more, this has a total of four plus three. There's none for 10, so that's seven out of 20. Seven out of 20, well, to get from 20 to 100 is times five, so seven times five is 35. So that's 35 out of 100, which is 35%. Here, for more than eight absences, it's two here and three here. That's five out of 20. That only goes to 25%. So that one can't be true. It's not both semesters have 35% eight days or higher. This one doesn't. This one does, but this one doesn't. So forget that. This would be false. Part two says the median number of absences for the fall semester is one day more than the median number of absences for the spring semester. I think we did that. We said median for fall was six, and for spring the median is five. Yep, that's one more. Okay, that was good. Sorry, paper on the other side. True. Part three. The range of the spring semester absences is the same as the range of the fall semester absences. 
color the range here is from 9 down to 0, and the range here is from 10 down to 0. So no, that's false. Okay, so our final is false, true, false. Number 8. Love this one. This is a normal type of question. Drew has a coin. Oh, by the way, I do believe that the questions that they pulled for the interims are extra difficult questions. They may have been just too tough for the test, and the ones that you're going to see on the real test should be simpler. But if you study with the extra hard ones, then you'll be most prepared. And that's what they gave us, so that's what we use. Uh, question 8. Again, this is a normal one. Drew has a coin. One side shows heads and the other side shows tails. He also has a six-sided number cube, or a die, with a number one through six on each side. He flips the coin, rolls the number cube, and records his results. What is the probability, written as a fraction, that the coin shows tails and he rolls a five? Well, tails is going to be one choice out of two, and five is one choice out of six. So you multiply one-half times one-sixth, and what do you get? Do -do -do giving you a pause. Yeah, one twelfth. That was a normal, regular problem. That's the kind that you'll have more of. Okay, question number nine. Mr. Wilson's first period and second period classes each took the same history test. The results are shown below. Okay, so we see first periods on top, second periods on the bottom. Immediately, you should think about what do you notice? Well, I can see that the spread here is smaller for first period than second period. Okay, interesting. Which statement is false? Ooh, false based on the information shown. So we're hoping that out of these four choices, three of them are easily proven to be true, and we have to pick the false. So I'm going to write myself a note. Pick one false. Okay, letter A. The interquartile range is smaller in Mr. Wilson's first period. Well, interquartile is represented here. Interquartile means the box. So the number on one edge of the box, just follow down the edge of the box to the distance to the other end of the box. Or you could just take this number minus this number. So look at the numbers below the edges of the box. That's called the interquartile. The median is right where that line happens inside the box. And you can always just look at the number below the line in the box. That's the median. So these box and whiskers are pretty cool. You can find things pretty fast. The interquartile range is smaller in Mr. Wilson's first period. Well, we're looking at the box part only, not the parts that stick out. Those are called the whiskers. So they're saying is smaller in the first period. It's this big, and the other one's smaller. No, nope, that's false. First period is bigger than second period. So forget that. We think that's the false one. So we're hoping, well, we'll put an F next to that. We're hoping that that's the answer that we choose. We shouldn't cross it out. Let me not cross it out. We know that this is false, at least we believe it's going to be false, and we think that's what we need to choose because we're supposed to pick the one false one. But we hope that none of these others are false. Okay, letter B. In each class, at least 25% of the students scored below a score of 75. Okay, with box and whiskers, each little chunk, it's broken up into four different parts if you look at the vertical lines. Each chunk is representing 25% of the data. So each quartile equals 25% of the data. In each class, at least 25% of the students scored below a score of 75. Okay, so we're looking for a score of 75. At least 25% scored below a score of 75. Well, here this is more than 25% that scored below 75, and here it's 50% that scored less because it's one quartile, two quartiles. So that looks to be true. Good. Whew. Don't count that one. We don't check that one because we're looking for the false. Letter C. Mr. Wilson's second period has a greater range of data compared to his first period. Okay, second period, that's a much larger range of data from 100 down to 55 than first period. That only goes from 90 down to 65. So this is like a 35 range and this is like a 45 range. So that's true. Good. Whew. Looking good. Letter D. The median of Mr. Wilson's first period is larger than the median of second period. Remember the median, we're just going to go straight down from the box. So they say the median of Mr. Wilson's first period is larger than the median of the second period. 
median of Mr. Wilson's first period is larger than the median of second period. Okay. We're looking for, I've got confused there. I confused myself. So we're looking for it to be true. I'm like, that's true. Uh-oh. But that's fine. Median of first period is 80. Median of second period is 75. So the median of Mr. Wilson's first period, 80, is larger than the median of the second period, 75. Okay, whew, that one's true. Alrighty, we did the work to double check. We made sure that we picked the one that's false, first choice. Nice. Okay, number nine. Michael flips a coin 20 times. The results of the trials are shown below, where H represents heads and T represents tails. So I used a tallying, and I counted up all the heads and all the tails. So we had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 heads out of 20, and 13 tails out of 20. Based on these results, what is the expected probability of the coin landing on heads if Michael flips this coin again? So this is kind of a strange question. Based on these results, what is the expected probability of the coin landing on heads if Michael flips this coin again? Well, heads would be 7 out of 20, which would be 35%. But it's a coin. What's the true probability of getting heads versus tails? Well, it's 1 to 1, right? So you have a 50-50 shot. So the probability, I would say, is one half. Kind of a trick question. So I'm not sure. I'm hoping that they threw this question out because it was ambiguous. You weren't sure. But uh, they probably have given you more choices now, and then you'll, you'll be able to pick what you think is best. Question 11. Bag contains the same size cubes of different colors. The number of cubes and colors are listed below. 12 red cubes, 10 green, 5 yellow, 9 blue, and 4 white. So the first thing you want to find out is how many total there are, because it doesn't say it up above. So add all these together, you'll be able to use your calculator function, and you get 40 total. Determine the probability of randomly drawing a green cube, returning it to the bag, and then randomly drawing a red cube. Well, a green cube is going to be 10 out of 40, which is equal to 1 fourth. A red cube is 12 out of 40, which is equal to 3 out of 10. So to figure the probability, you take each of these and you multiply them together. One-fourth times three-tenths. So that's going to equal three-fortieths. Now, next question. Is it more likely or less likely for this event to occur when the first cube is not returned to the bag before drawing the second? Okay, so that means there's going to be one less cube in the bag the second time. They don't put the green cube back in. Here they said they did put the green cube back in, returning it to the bag. So they're trying to see what happens differently if you don't put the cube back in the bag for the first draw, for the second draw. They say use the drop-down menus to choose the correct responses that will make each statement true. The probability of drawing a green cube from the bag, it's still the first event, is still going to be 10 out of 40, which is equal to 1 fourth. The probability of drawing a red cube from the bag now is 12 out of 39 because there's one less cube in the bag. Take the two probabilities to get, okay, so now we're going to multiply 1 fourth times 12 over 39. We remember our buddies, the factor bubbles. So we're going to divide by 4, divide by 4. This equals 1, this equals 3. And so this is going to equal 3 out of 39. So 3 out of 39 is greater than 3 out of 40. Is this event less likely or more likely when the green cube is not replaced after the first draw? Well, 1 fourth times 12 out of 39 equals 3 out of 39 versus 3 out of 40. So it means it's more likely, a little bit more likely, that if you don't replace the second one, you'll have a greater chance of pulling if you don't replace the green cube in the beginning, you'll have a greater chance of pulling a red cube the second time because there's just one less cube. And that's it. We're going to go on to question 12 in the next video.